DIY wiring harness or prefabricated wiring harness, which is right for you and your project. I don't know, I got a few choices here. This video will try to answer that question as well as share some general knowledge on automotive wiring that I've picked up over the years. I'll even share my process for building a wiring harness from scratch. For my current project, which you will see a little bit of in this video, I'm using the Resolve EV vehicle control unit, as well as the wiring harness also made by Resolve. And I'm using that for my 1962 Mercury Comet, which I'm converting to electric. Subscribe to this channel, this old jalopy, if you want to see the videos for that project. But the advice I'm giving in this video applies to other setups, such as the painless wiring harnesses, Phytec, and Holly EFI systems, MSD ignition and launch control systems, and many more. Let's start with the obvious. A prefabricated wiring harness is going to be much more organized, much easier to install, more reliable, more expensive, more plug and play. And then a, you know, a garage built wiring harness, you're going to save a lot of money, but it's not going to be nearly as organized and as neat. However, you can build it to the exact lengths of your vehicle here so that you have exactly the right amount of wire that you need and nothing will come up short. However, I think the biggest difference is in the quality and reliability because a prefabricated harness will have a high quality automotive grade connectors that will be difficult to acquire for most people. And unlike a garage built harness, a prefab harness will not contain any spliced wires and risky crimp connectors. This is what I'm talking about here. Here's a wire harness that I made in the garage uh, a little over, a little less than a year ago. This is the wire to the throttle that comes all the way to one of these connectors here. Well, it, you know, it had to be spliced into the wire here and it had to be spliced into the wire here. And now t multiply that times eight for this connector alone. And then multiply that by the number of connectors there are, which there are many, many of. There's a lot of splices. I'll get to those uh, kind of splices here in a bit later on in this video, what's good and bad about them but each one of them is a potential failure point. Plus, many of these wires are very thin, as small as 24 gauge, and it's very difficult to get a good crimp on these wires this small. But a prefab harness, there should be only one length of wire all the way from the pin and one connector to the pin and the other connector and no splices. With those big differences out of the way, you should know that even a prefab harness will require some work to get it installed, and even a home-built wiring harness will require hundreds of dollars in materials. Maybe that helps, maybe that doesn't, but let's go over now how to, uh, how to install these. Okay, I'm just gonna give a really quick overview here of some of the basics you're going to need to do your own wiring for your car. Here's all the tools and supplies, I'll go over that in a minute, but let's start with the number one rule of doing your own wiring is do not get high first. You need to have a very clear mind before you get started in the wiring. The number two rule I would say is have a really good uh, comfortable area to do this in. Have a little workbench here so you can do as much work as you can out of the car and on the bench. All right, let's go over some of the basic tools you're gonna need. Um, start from left to right here. You have a label maker. This can be really handy. You're definitely gonna need a good multimeter. You got ohms, ohms is for checking continuity. And you got voltage here for checking what has power and what does not. This is your cable cutter for, especially for larger gauge cables, I would say four gauge and up. Wire strippers, obviously, you're gonna use these to get the insulation off of the ends of the wire. Speaking of the wire, let's go over that real fast. These are all different types of wire right here. You have stranded copper wire, but this is wrapped in silicone. Not ideal for a car environment. You want something that's wrapped in PVC. This is gonna be a lot more cut resistant. You can probably get away with using silicone, especially if you put it all in you know, cable shields. Here's some more PVC, but this is thicker gauge. By the way, both of these are from the parts store. The, uh, I tried ordering some from Amazon and they ended up sending me this, which looks fine, but this is solid core, not stranded. So you definitely do not want to use solid core. You need to have some electrical tape here. 
good old electrical tape. This is Tessa Loom Tape. Well, this one isn't Tessa brand, but it's Loom Tape, which is kind of a cloth. I really like this because it sticks to itself so well, whereas the vinyl stuff will start to unravel very quickly. And then orange is for your high voltage stuff. This is rated up to rated up to 600 volts. But the thing to watch out for the most is your connectors. You don't want to use these. These are trash. These are junk. When it has this uh, solid jacket around it, you want the stuff with a clear jacket. This is all from Amazon, but this is from the parts store, the auto parts store. So you can find, the, find this uh, domestically as well. This is from Harbor Freight. This is good too. Let's talk about these high heat, excuse me, let's talk about these low heat solder stuff. I do not prefer these except for the very, very small gauge. So if I'm working with 22 gauge in smaller, I'm actually going to use these. And there is a little bit of a trick to using them, a little bit of a, a technique that I've developed. I'll show you that in a bit. For these, though, these are excellent, especially the blue and the yellow ones for the medium and larger gauge. For the red ones, these work well, but I um, what I have developed for my technique... Oh, by the way, this is the connector, the crimp... This is the crimp tool you're going to need for these style connectors. For the red ones here, the smaller gauge, I believe this is 16 to 22 gauge. What I do is I crimp it first, use the red setting there, and then I give it a little extra squeeze with that crimp tool there. And then of course you hit it with the heat gun here to activate the shrink wrap. That is why I really like these. The shrink wrap on these guys are awesome um, because they're self-sealing. I don't know if there's a very small amount of like a, uh, a hot glue sort of material in there, but they are self-sealing, which is not present in these style heat shrinks. Here's another thing you might, you're probably going to want. Magnetic cable tie mounts. These are from Amazon as well. Very, very good. I've been using them. They work very well. If you want the ultimate source of cable, head to McMasterCar.com. They have a whole section just on automotive grade wires. That's not a discount website. You're paying a little bit of money, but you, you're going to be getting the best. You know, this spool was almost $20, so you're still spending as much money locally as if you ordered it online. I never had any good luck finding this sort of stuff on Amazon. Make sure you have lots of connectors. I bought extra ones. You know, I have a kit here, but I bought extra ones for what I when I knew I would need more of. I'm using a lot of the red gauge ones because I'm using a lot of 20 gauge and 18 gauge wires with my wiring kit. One more good source of wire is trailer wire. This is going to be a lot thicker gauge. You can buy them from, from the big box stores like Home Depot, Lowe's, Menards, etc. for a really good price. And I was able to use some gift cards to buy this. We've gone over the basics here of what you'll need. Now I'll show you what I, I'll show you my process and how I, how I think it all out in my head, how I organize myself and what do I do to make it all work. Now when it comes to figuring all this out, everyone's going to be different. Um, and especially, you know, it makes a huge difference if you are building your own wiring harness or if you're using a fabricated wiring harness like I'm doing, you know, you're still going to have a lot of work to do, but it's all going to be a lot simpler. This is really nice. It's all labeled. This doesn't cover your headlights, your horn, your high beams, your radio, your heater, your AC, everything that's not essential to getting the wheels moving. That's where these relays will all be used. And here's the deal. Here's what I've done. I have 
organized everything into my glove box, or at least as much as I can. You have, this is the fuse panel that came with the wiring harness. Here's all the relays, and then top of the relays, I've screwed on a little fuse box here. This is the main fuse, so that when the ignition switch is turned on, this is activated, and then that feeds so many other ex components, you know, accessories, etc. And then way in the back is the Resolve EV controller. So what I've done for this build is I built a conceptual drawing, not a full schematic, just a little conceptual drawing of what, what components are on the key switch, what components are always on. I've also made a spreadsheet so I can figure out what fuses I need, what relays I need, what circuits need relays and which do not. And I'm going to be honest with you, I don't, this isn't so bad for me. This is a breeze compared to replacing seized, rust seized leaf springs or rebuilding drum brakes. I'd much rather be doing this. Definitely really helps to have a bench seat here. I even have a pillow so I can be doing the wiring and not straining my neck. But for guys with bucket seats, I'm sorry. I feel for you. That's going to be tough. You're going to be upside down. Your neck is going to be pressed into the floorboards. Your ass is going to be up in the air. Your back's going to be at an awkward angle. So try and get as much as you can done on the workbench. And then bring it inside here and get it connected up. And of course, you don't have to use... You don't have to purchase your own wiring harness. You can build your own. That is what I did with this one here before I got the Resolve one. I made my own. The way I built this wiring harness is I put the controller on a little bit of, mounted it to some plywood, splayed out the wires coming out of it in the connector, and then got a bunch of these distribution blocks, these terminal blocks, and put it all around it in a grid, labeled everything really well by the numbers, and then just started one wire at a time, started connecting everything according to the schematic that came with the documentation, that came with the Resolve documentation. And I was able to get this whole thing built. And what you saw in that video actually wasn't the finished, wasn't the wiring harness. That was just sort of a, a prototype. And once I had everything tested and working, then I started building out the wires with the correct length that I needed, getting everything wrapped up into looms. I actually ended up using some Cat5 cable here, some Ethernet cable, some USB cable. This might be like an old FireWire cable, just whatever I could find. Um, I was even able to get an OBD2 port. Unfor you know, kind of sadly, I'm not going to use this at all. So if you would like to have it, let me know. You can build your own wiring harness. You don't want to be doing this, though, on your back inside the vehicle. You want to do this on the bench, have it all ready, and then go and install it. You don't want to be wiring this all under the dashboard, of course. Okay, here's my tech tip of the day. Because let's say I need to connect these 20-gauge wires. could use this connector here. Um, for anything smaller than 20 gauge, I would wanna use one of these low heat solder connectors. And it's just because those crimp on connectors don't work very well in my experience with really small gauge wires. But these, these low heat solder connect connectors aren't perfect either. They're just not a very strong connection. And this bit of red, this part, this red part, this is hot glue, I believe. And this is instrumental to the connection just because without it, it's not very strong. So what I'm saying is you can yank on these wires and it'll come right apart. But here's what I do. Because most people just overlap them. Instead of just overlapping them, take one, give it a little pinch like this, and then wrap it around. And now it's wrapped on there. Then you slide the solder connector over it. Then you hit it with the heat gun. Here's the other tech tip. You wanna watch the solder closely as it melts. 
So I've had some that just don't seem to melt. Like maybe like one out of ten. Let's we'll see if you can watch it melt. There it goes, starting to flow. So just make sure that the solder flows and then wait a while before you yank on it and pull on it because it'll just come right apart, see? And after everything I mentioned, there's still something that I haven't brought up yet. I haven't talked yet about a soldering iron and soldering them on. Well, honestly, I just don't trust myself with a soldering iron. I've had this soldering iron for 20 years and I just don't use it very often. I prefer the crimp on stuff. It's just what I prefer possibly. But of course, this is a time tested and great way to make connections. All right, guys, that'll do it for today's video. But subscribe to this channel, this old jalopy. If you want to see me wire up this vehicle, use everything we learned about today to get that thing wired up and running. And then after that, we're going to talk about this guy's sneak peek here. A very busy summer lined up, so subscribe if you want to catch these videos.